If you've been following computer displays, you've probably heard of a lot of terms getting tossed around. CRTs versus LCDs versus LEDs versus OLEDs. But what exactly are these display technologies, and how do they differ? How do they work, and which ones should you consider? In this video, I'm going to try to explain the fundamental differences between the three main categories of displays and how exactly they differ, as well as introduce some of the subcategories. With that said, let's get started. Over the last 30 years, the three most common types of displays have historically been CRTs, and those are cathode ray tubes. Uh, and then for the, for those, those were dominant all the way from the invention of computers and television all the way until the 2000s. In the 2000s, we started to see LCDs, LCD being liquid crystal displays. And more modernly, in the past few years, we've seen the introduction of newer self-emissive panels. These include things like OLED and micro-LED, with OLED being the current uh, dominant type in that category. So as I said, of these, everything before the 2000s was pretty much all CRTs. Most of the LCDs, now we're moving on to OLEDs. But within each of these, we also have lots of various categories. You've probably heard terms like IPS, VA, or TN getting tossed around. Um, those are all various subtypes of LCDs, and we'll explain these in a little bit more detail. Now, each of these can be defined by two main properties. First of all is uh, how they fundamentally work and whether they are self-emissive. Um, and we'll start from the old, uh, progress onto the new, and then we'll also talk about what each of those subtypes mean and how they impact the output. Starting with a typical CRT, I'm not going to spend as much time on these because you don't really see them around well at all these days. But for a typical CRT, you would have an electron gun, shooting in a vacuum tube to the display. Um, the display would then be coated with various phosphors. Uh, traditionally, these the panels were curved, if you look at older TVs, just because so it had the same uh, duration uh, or the same distance to the middle as well as to the sides for when the gun is scanning. And how these worked was, essentially, you would have two coils, one doing your XY and one doing the, um, well, sorry, one doing the X-axis, one doing the Y-axis. And since electrons are negatively charged, you can always use electromagnets to shift the beam. So essentially, on your display, if this is the, so looking at it from the front, whereas this would be a side view. If you're looking from the front, without any input to those electromagnets, you would just get a dot in the middle. And of course, we then use electromagnets to scan all the way here from left to right, as well as top to down, ending the frame here. And of course, then that shoots back up. We can, uh, there's lots of different characteristics here. For example, uh, you use essentially, you, uh, CRTs make use of flyback transformers in order to convert an incoming sine wave input into a square wave so that they, that looks something like this. And that's what allows the axis to go left to right and then immediately shoot back left in time to draw the next row. Whereas you see the same thing happening from top to bottom. So it'll go top to bottom when it's ramping up and then immediately shoot back to the top. Uh, and of course, this means that the display has to be mounted at a slight angle, because otherwise, as you might imagine, if the down display is always, so if this is, say, the uh, y-axis, the x-axis is, of course, going to be a lot slower and then eventually reach up there. So if this is the x, the horizontal is a lot quicker, because you scan left to right first, and that happens for however many lines you have, and then you'll have to go bottom to top. So you would notice that then there is essentially a large vector that moves this way, as well as a small vector that's pointing you down, which would result in a diagonal line. So instead, we shift the we uh, tilt the display slightly so that the added vector will go straight. But we're all, that's basically nitpicking into fine details at this point, and those don't really impact the experience too much. The core thing is, you, we will uh, then, uh, well, using a single phosphor, you would get a black and white output. To get color output, we started using multiple phosphors, and that's how we have uh, data blocks RGB phosphors to do for television as well as computer monitors. And CRTs reign supreme until roughly the 2000s. They have some of the benefits that you would get with a modern technology like OLED, fundamentally. Um, so while the X and Y is influenced by the electromagnets, the actual brightness of the dot, how bright of a, that point in the screen is going to be is determined by how much power you're sending to the electron gun. So if the screen is supposed to be black, you're not sending any power at all, which means you will actually get near a uh, pitch black output, which you don't get with LCDs, and we'll talk about why. So typically, gray in the dark, because you have near, um, very good near black levels when the electron gun is shut off, as well as you have pretty much no motion blur. Well, you have a bit of blur, because that's what's needed to work. Um, 
essentially the whole way where CRTs work is through persistence of vision, which means that you're just relying on the fact that after this thing scans by, the human eye just happens to see those pixels are still glowing, even though, well, the electron gun's no longer pointed there. So we rely on this, uh, the phosphors to maintain the output for slightly longer so that essentially after a electron hits them, they'll kind of do something like this, where they'll ramp down slowly, and then you rely on the brain to smooth that out over a frame rate. But this means that you practically get zero motion blur because the whole frame is being properly redrawn. And well, for 99% of the time, each pixel individually itself is pretty much dark. It only lights up well, when the electron gun points to it. So although this was essentially improved over the years to have flat displays, and then Sony has their Trinitron tubes, which use um, aperture lines in order to get a much cleaner image. Fundamentally, this has remained the same. And uh, you also probably heard that these run entirely analog, and there's really no such thing as pixels. Um, if you zoom in with, if you look in with a magnifier glass, you will see RGB, what look like subpixels. Uh, that's actually part of a shadow mask. So that means that at non-native resolutions, it'll still look, the image will look pretty sharp because, well, there is no set defined line of uh, pixels that would exist on something like a modern um, display. So unfortunately, though, mercury, lead, and shooting electrons is, uh, turns out to not be the best idea, particularly for well, when you need to get rid of these things, um, as well as having fundamental issues like burn-in, uh, burn which we will get back into when we talk about OLEDs and moder uh, moder more modern technologies. Um, because essentially, if the image is always pointing at the same spot for too long of a time, uh, that area of the, those phosphors will start to wear down because of constantly being bombarded by these electrons. And that means that you will always be able to view, like, an essentially a preview of that image. You'll see this particularly with CRT hooked up to, like, CCTV cameras, where the image will be completely burned in because of a static, non-moving thing. Or like a TV showing the news, the logos will be completely burned. So that's CRT. So they're roughly self-emissive. Um, they contain... Toxic chemicals, I mean, we no longer use them. <laughs> the most common type we use these days are LCDs. With LCDs, again, we'll do a side view first. Um, LCDs themselves, as the name implies, it's uh, liquid crystals. Essentially, it's a gel-like substance. And depending on the type of LCD you're using, LCDs can be very simple. If you look at any basic calculator with a seven-segment display, chances are that seven-segment display is using an LCD, not an LED. Um, you can tell because if you tilt it, you'll be able to see uh, at various angles how it looks. Also, if you take a polarizing filter and you rotate a polarizing filter, you'll be able to find angles where you can and can't make up the image, which says a lot about how they work, but we'll get back to that. And how they work depends quite a bit on the type of LCD. So again, a basic LCD would be something like you see in a calculator. And of course, uh, as with uh, OLEDs, there's uh, passive driven, passive matrix, as well as active matrix LCDs. Um, pretty much, I think most things are active now. Uh, so TFT LCDs are uh, thin film transistors. So that's basically where, I mean, exactly as the name applies, you have a thin film of transistors, and you are actively driving the full display. Actively means you're providing a signal the whole time to each individual uh, pixel. But essentially, if we look at it from the front, as you might uh, expect, uh, let's assume that this is a much lower... Uh, very greatly zoomed in. So assume uh, on a black and white LCD, these pixels will typically be square. On RGB LCDs, they're typically rectangles. We'll talk about why. But um, essentially, each one of these will be able to be a 1 or a 0, or on modern displays, oh, I mean, for something like a calculator, it'll be a 1 or 0, either black or white, essentially. But for modern displays, we can do 8-bit, 10-bit, basically shades of how emissive they're going to be. Well, not emissive, but how transparent or opaque. And we'll talk about how that, why that matters. But on a modern display, you'll probably get RGB stripes. And the pixels will be rectangular, typically, or each subpixel will be. And that will just be to ensure that when you look at a pixel as a whole, it's roughly square. I mean, it will be perfectly one-to-one -one square on computer monitors. Computers use square pixels. Uh, but uh, you, will have, you will divide that into three thinner uh, rectangles so that it results in a complete square. Now, the important thing is, if you look at one of these from the side, obviously they're quite a bit more popular than CRTs, even when they first came out, because it's a lot thinner, it's a lot lighter, much thinner, flat screen lighter. You can actually put it on laptops and whatnot, which would have been impossible with big, fat CRT tubes. And of course, CRTs limited how big you could make a display, because you needed space in all three dimensions to fit the massive electron gun and vacuum chamber now. So much easier in that regard, we have a flat screen 
each pixel itself, as I said, is pretty much gets to choose between whether it is opaque or transparent. So if we look at one individual pixel, that pixel can be, well, pixels are typically aren't circular. They're, unless you're talking about OLEDs, they're typically square. Um, uh, the gel substance can go between being, well, it actually doesn't go between being transparent and opaque. What you can actually do is, for example, I'll use TN as an example because it's one of the, well, at least by today's standards, one of the simpler types. IPS and uh, what Samsung used to call PLS work in similar manners, but slightly different. So we will we'll get to the types of these uh, later on. And um, as I said, there's two, uh, the two main defining characteristics of LCDs will be what backlight type they use. And that's because they're always backlit, and we'll talk about what that means, as well as what actual type of LCD that they use. So the fundamental type, um, if each one can go between, uh, so for something like a TN, that being TN being twisted pneumatic, but we'll get to those types later on, um, you can cho change the crystal's uh, alignment. Now, uh, we can make use of this through a couple other, combining a couple of other technologies. For example, uh, polarization of light. You might have heard that if you have light that is horizontally polarized, um, and polarization is a completely other topic that would need, we'd need a couple hours to explain. So I'm not going to talk about that in this video. But if we have polarized light, and essentially if we have a horizontal polarization filter, that light will be allowed to pass through. If this is vertical, if we have rays of light, polarization is essentially which way the wave is going. Um, you can choose to basically allow that light to go through, which means that this essentially looks like it is transparent, and you will get the full image on the output or we can choose to give it the opposite orientation, which will essentially turn the pixel opaque and will not let any light pass through. So by combining this the, uh, principle of uh, polarization by changing the orientation of these uh, crystals, we can allow light to pass through or not pass through. And essentially, well, the LCD itself isn't the one allowing light to pass through. The LCD is just the thing that chooses its orientation. So if we look at the side view, and we have a plane of uh, liquid crystals, which make it a little bit bigger. So say this is the panel of actual liquid crystals. Um, in front of this, you will have a polarization filter. That polarization filter is essentially doing what I've described here, where if the polarization filter uh, the, combined with the orientation of the crystals in the LCD, it will either allow light to pass through or will not allow light to pass through. Now, of course, if I had a black plastic cabinet at the back of this, that doesn't do us much good because then well, you'd be going between, yeah, translucent and opaque, but there's nothing to see. So what we then do is behind this, we then use a form of backlighting. So backlighting will essentially produce the photons that are required for the LCD. In a really simple example, uh, you won't have a backlight. For something like a calculator, you'll just have a reflective surface on the back such that the light of the room you're in will go through and bounce back. And that's why you won't be able to see them in the dark, but that's why you will be able to get shades of gray out of them by essentially blocking how much of the room's light is reflected back. For a modern LCD, though, this can be as simple as an incandescent light bulb, although that would be a terrible backlight, and we'll talk about why later. But you would get very dim blues out of something like that, and you will get way too much red and green. But for a long time, backlights were typically fluorescent. So think about the fluorescent tubes that are in this lecture hall. Uh, take that, put instead of uh, using it to light a room, put it in a plastic cabinet, and put an LCD in front of it so that the light could shine through. That's basically what it was, a light with LCD with a polarization filter. And that way, essentially, when the crystals are oriented the light way and the panel turns transparent or translucent, you'll be able to see the backlight coming through. However, when the pixels then rotate, become opaque, you will see that as black because most of the light from the backlight will not be making it to you. Now, that would give you a black and white display. By using some colors along with those uh, crystals, inside the gel, we can then provide colors to this. So if you then take the red pixels and you allow light to pass through those, well then the white light from the backlight is getting colored red because those pixels are allowing light to pass through. And if the green and blue subpixels are not allowing light to pass through, they're being opaque, then you would see that as a red image. Similarly, if you have the, uh, if they're allowing blue light to pass through, but you're blocking the red and the green, you will see that as a blue image. And of course, by combining that for each individual pixel, uh, we can get typically 16.8 million colors that you see today. And of course, that's because we're not just stuck with fully allowing light or blocking light. Uh, these days, we can 
run these with either pulse width modulation or through DC voltages so that you can essentially change what uh, brightness, how much of, the, of that particular color can pass through. And why RGB? Well, that's something for a completely separate video related to how human eyes see and whatnot and psychology. So that's backlights, LCD, and polarization filters and how those work. Now, as I said, the two main uh, things that distinguish LCD displays, and again, these are the most common uh, types of displays that you see on the market today, are the backlight type and the LCD type. So let's start with backlight. The two main types of backlights that you will see will be fluorescent and LED. So that would be either CCFL or LED. And of course, that's because when LCDs were first being introduced, LED technology wasn't advanced enough to make them small and compact and efficient enough to run the whole display. So essentially, CCFLs are very much like the uh, flush that you'd see, except uh, the CC means that they're cold, cold cathode. So whereas a typical fluorescent lamp would have two incandescent coils at the ends acting as a hot cathode, so when you turn it on, the two ends will heat up, essentially release enough ions into it until the thing can arc and then start producing light. CCFLs don't need uh, those end coils. This allows them to be a lot thinner, uh, which, has, which is what has allowed them to be put into like thin laptops. Um, and it also means that you can turn them on and off uh, without, burning out the, without burning out the cathodes every time you do it. So, of course, CCFLs require high voltages, which means that for LCDs using this backlight type, they also need inverters. Uh, because your DC 12 volts or whatever you're feeding in will need to get bumped up to thousands of volts AC in order to run these. Um, this is, again, unlike hot uh, cathode fluorescent tubes where you would be running them at relatively low voltages. But this means that you will need to uh, run a DC source up to a higher voltage AC source. Whereas with LEDs, of course, being diodes, they can run purely on DC power. In fact, you probably won't even be giving it the full 12 volts. You will be using buck converters in order to um, lower the voltage that you're feeding it. But uh, regardless of which type of backlight you're using, the principle is the same. We have some amount of light, and we're either allowing it to pass through or not allowing it to pass through to, through colored filters. Now, next, I'd, uh, I would just like to point out that there's been a, there, so this is where the marketing sometimes tends to get confusing versus the actual technology. If you're looking, and you're looking uh, historically from, say, 2000s to 2010, an LCD display, an LCD display always meant you were getting a CCFL backlight because that was the only backlight type essentially that was available to manufacturers and engineers. So you really didn't have a choice. It wasn't really all that confusing. You were choosing between CRTs and LCDs. Around 2010 or so, they started introducing what they called LED displays. Now, that might sound confusing because when you see LED, you might think, oh, the word LED is actually here, like with OLED. But that's actually completely wrong. LED displays are not OLED and they're not actually self-emissive. So if you look at how LEDs work, LEDs can be as simple as pure red, pure green, pure blue, depending on which phosphor you're using, or white light coming from a foam flashlight or the light on above the whiteboards. Uh, we see them in use everywhere these days. Hearing of an LED display, you might be inclined to think that how that should work is that if I have red, green, and blue LEDs, well, you might think that it's the LEDs that will light up to produce the image that you see on the monitor. But that's simply not the case. With an LED display, even if it has LED in the name, what you're actually getting is an LED backlight. What that means is you still have an LCD. They're not a separate display type. It is still the same fundamental principle, LCD polarization filter. The only thing that's changing is instead of using fluorescent tubes in order to light the back, the liquid crystals, we're now using LEDs. So think like LED strips, basically put that along a, a pane of glass in order to diffuse it, and that's how LED displays work. Very much, same fundamental, again, this is something that has been very confusing in marketing over the years, but it's the same fundamental technology, just instead of using fluorescence, we're using LEDs in order to provide a backlighting source. So uh, don't get confused by that. And of course, the second thing I mentioned was the LCD types. Now, these are a little bit more interesting because there's lots of different advantages and disadvantages and trade-offs that you make depending on the type of LCD that you use. So historically, you just have like TFT LCDs, thin film transistor LCDs, and then uh, these days, you won't see plain old LCDs. You'll see one of a couple types. Um, so on most cheap displays, you will see what are called TN panels. TN standing for uh, twisted pneumatic. Or no one ever calls it that, so we'll just keep it with the acronym. You will see VA panels. VA standing for vertical alignment. And you will see IPS panels, which stands for in-plane switching. Um, you will see a lot of what they call IPS-like panels because the actual IPS word itself is um, a technology is patented by LG Display. So 
they're the only ones that can use the official branding IPS, but you'll see lots of IPS like. So you'll see, for example, HWVA, which stands for hyper wide viewing angle. That's what um, I believe AU Optronics calls their IPS equivalent. So there's a lot of these IPS like things. Uh, Samsung used to call theirs PLS or plane to line switching. Again, fundamentally the same thing as IPS, same advantages, same disadvantages, just slightly different ways of doing it to skirt the patents and not have to uh, pay LG. So between these, what are the key differences? Well, they all work by changing the polarization of um, the crystals so that to either allow light to pass through when combined with the polarization filter or not allow light to pass through. Um, some, not all of them technically need polarization filters. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, fine details there about how exactly they're manufactured, but we can talk about the key differences and the key advantages and disadvantages of each. Are you able to fall asleep? So let's do a quick comparison of these various types. So pros and cons for TNs, and again, remember that these are all subtypes of LCD and, well, what they call LED displays. So that's, you can have an LCD with an LED backlight with one of various LCD types. So TNs, well, the first thing is that they're really cheap to manufacture these days, which of course means that they make their way into all sorts of devices where maybe they're not even the best type, but they're so commonplace that I have to mention it. That's why you see them everywhere. The second thing is they have relatively fast response times. And finally, a third benefit is that um, they tend to have lower motion blur. Because essentially, original LCDs would um, take some time to transition between these uh, orientations. And of course, that transition means that you're going to, if I'm like moving a cursor, by the time you get to see the cursor, that's what I mean by reaction response time is, it takes time for the crystal to turn vertical or horizontal, vice versa. And you see that as like image fading and fading out when you move. Motion blur means that, well, that continues over time. So if I'm moving and like, if I have an application open on my screen and I'm, you know, moving it around, uh, that means that you end up seeing the trails of that because it can't actually turn the pixels off fast enough. And that tends to be very annoying, especially for when there's moving objects for things like uh, gaming or movies. So TNs have very much helped to reduce that compared to traditional LCD displays. So that's why they started to take over in the 2000s right after like early LCDs because they were, had much faster response and lower uh, blur. So of course, however, it's not magical. They do have notable downsides. And the biggest downside these days is um, they tend to have bad viewing angles. In fact, there's really easy ways to tell if you're on a TN display. If you look at the display from higher or lower, you'll see that the display gets too bright or too dark. Um, so typically, these displays are calibrated to a gamma of 2.2. Um, think about gamma as something that's existed since the CRT days. Uh, it's literally represented by the symbol gamma. That the, represents the exponential factor of the curve because, well, it turns out it's a lot more efficient to transmit signals exponentially versus linearly, and the human eye see exponentially. So displays run, obviously, exponentially. And so these days, a typical gamma value of a display that you are aiming for would be a gamma of 2.2 in SDR mode. In HDR mode, you have stuff like PQ and whatnot that takes over instead. So if you look at a display from too high or too low, you will notice the gamma value essentially tends to shift, and the display will either get too bright or too dark to use, um, depending on your angle. So very bad viewing angles. So that's if you're going top-bottom, especially bad in the vertical um, axis. And if you're in the horizontal axis, you will typically see this being manifested as the display turning a greenish versus pinkish color when you look at it from the left or the right. Which one depends on uh, more precisely on which subpixel orient uh, layout it's using. But there's tests you can do online that will essentially allow you to look at an image. You, if you, it's easy if you have like red cyan alternating lines. You can tell if you have a TN panel. So color shift in the horizontal axis, brightness and gamma shift in the vertical axis. Really bad to look at if you're not straight on. The other bad thing about them, well, they don't, they're not really the best with colors. Um, this has greatly advanced over the years, and not all of it is uh, the fact that it's a TN. A lot of it tends to come down to the fact that they're used on cheaper displays. But given the low viewing angles and how often the color shifts when you're off axis, mm, you're not going to get the best colors out of these. And essentially, they also don't have particularly good. Well, they have OK, so I'll put it as a maybe. Um, they tend to have OK black levels. Better than something like IPS, but not ideal. Definitely not something like a self-emissive. So I think that's the rough pros and cons of TN. Let's, uh, so TNs, again, to, the, to this day, you will see them on lots of cheap uh, computer monitors or on laptops especially, uh, even though they're not particularly compelling. 
let's move on to VA. VA stands for vertical alignment. It's used, uh, it's used typically these days on mid-tier displays or more uh, specifically, specifically, it's very common on a lot of TV as well as IPS. VA and IPS are typically what you will see in most premium -ish displays. VA on the slightly cheaper end, IPS on the slightly more premium end. Um, you'll see mini LED. Mini LED is a backlight type. I'll talk about that when we get the backlight types newer, so I didn't really include it on the CCFL LED because it's not as major. You'll, as I said, very common on TVs as well as mid-tier gaming displays. VAs are, um, well, the first advantage is better colors than TN. And just so I don't upset my audience, I'll fix the spelling of the word color here. So they have better viewing angles. Again, not the best. IPS is typically better from both the color gamut stance as well as the viewing angle stance. But this is a market improvement over TN. And we'll, we'll make a comparison chart maybe down here or something. You also get much better black levels. In fact, you'll get some of the best black levels in any display. Except OLEDs, of course. You get the best black levels between the L various types of LCDs. Um, so when you're looking at it spot on, uh, a dark scene will actually look uh, dark typically. Um, unfortunately, they still have some color shift. So not the best viewing angle. Um, another plus, actually, is that they're typically using a lot of these curved uh, displays because the panel type is a lot easier uh, to implement into curved displays. You, can, you will see some IPS panels on curved displays, but it's typically very rare, and VA tends to be the main kind there. Um, so I would say that's pretty much a rough overview. They also are better than IPS in terms of uh, response time, so not as good, but um, We'll put that as a question mark. The response time and motion blur tend to be OK. So I wanted to give you an in-person demonstration of just how bad the smearing issue on VA can be. So on your left, you are seeing a 27-inch IPS 4K display, 60 hertz. On the right, you are seeing a 1440p 165 hertz VA panel. In the background is a dark gray terminal and and the black MPV window, and you can see just how much smearing occurs when I move the MPV panel in front of the dark gray terminal. On the IPS, this looks perfectly fine, even though it's only running at 60 hertz, so it might not look super smooth, you don't get any type of smearing or trails behind it. However, on the VA panel on the right, you can clearly see it almost looks like you have the Windows cursor trails turned on, and you can see it's very smudgy and smeary. You can also drive the refresh rate up to all the way up to 240 Hz, and typically VA panels will be fine. TN, you can drive all the way up to 500 or so these days uh, before the panel starts to you know, completely freak out. Um, so, OK response times. And it kind of falls as a good middle ground between TN and IPS. Now, I guess I've been talking about IPS for a lot. So, what is IPS? IPS is in plane switching. It's what I would probably consider the best LCD type. So IPS displays are, have, tend to have very good colors. They have the best viewing angles of the types of LCDs. They have a couple of fundamental downsides. The first is that IPS panels tend to have something, experience something called IPS glow. And what that means is that dark scenes won't typically look very dark. If you're looking at a perfectly black screen on IPS, it's, def it's not the same thing as backlight bleed. Backlight bleed is how much of the backlight makes it through when the panel is set to being opaque. So when it should be blocking all light, some of it will obviously make it through you know, between the gaps of the pixels and whatnot. IPS globes, if you look at it, especially for spot on, especially on the outer sides, you will tend to see it almost look gray instead of looking black. And that's a fundamental issue. You can't really change that. It's core to the technology. If you want low blacks, then you have to go uh, VA. So let me try to quickly explain IPS glow. IPS glow is the stuff you see here and here. So if I move the camera, you will notice that you never get very good contrast if I turn the lights off, especially. This is not a light source that's behind me. This is something that is inherent uh, to the panel type itself. So whenever you have a dark image, you won't actually be able to get very deep blacks because you will always have IPS glow. And the closer you are, the worse it will be. So you can see this part and this part right now just look very bright. If you sit far enough away, maybe that's not as big of an issue. If you're looking at your display during bright lights, that's also probably fine. Here's another IPS. This one's 1440p, and you can see the exact same thing where you will see, no matter where you look, the other part of the monitor will appear to be brighter, and that's just called IPS glow. If you're not on pitch black and you're on gray, for example, 
you won't experience it. So it's only really an issue if you're in a dark room. Um, you wouldn't notice it if the room is pretty bright. And it's also only really an issue um, when you're looking at something really uh, dark on the display. But also, they don't have the very best uh, response times. So as a result of this, you, know, you typically won't see IPS panels used for a lot of gaming displays. And this has improved over the years. You see technologies like rapid IPS or fast IPS. Everyone calls it something different. Uh, and you will see IPS used on gaming monitors these days just because the colors are so much better. Um, how good? Well, on an IPS, you can typically get almost 100. You can get 100% Adobe RGB coverage if you have a proper backlight type, um, which you will not be getting with any other display type. You can easily exceed 100% DCI-P3. Very good colors. This is why you will always see the content creation or content consumption monitors be IPS. So whether you're either like watching movies or you're editing for them, you will typically see IPS monitors in use, because just because they're much more color accurate. You can easily calibrate them versus TN. Much better viewing angles, so if you're looking at it off-axis, colors still tend to look good. You can also easily get away with doing 10-bit or 12-bit color, so you get a lot uh, more finer control. TN, you really won't see anything past 8-bit. 8-bit being so, you won't even see 8, but half the time they'll be 6-bit. Six 6-bit six means that, well, each pixel goes 0 to 64. And then it does dithering to try to get 0 to 255. And you can easily, easily see banding uh, on those displays. So that's something what's called bit depth. Um, it's really a separate type, but it's kind of tied to this. You will see displays using uh, 6 plus 2 bits. They call it 6 plus 2. When they say 8 bit, they typically mean 6 plus 2. That's 6 bits of actual bit depth. So that means that the pixels can show from 0 to 64. They have 64 shades of red, green, blue, which means in total you don't get very many colors. Um, you will see 8 plus 2 in use. 8 plus 2 these days is fairly common. Sometimes they'll be called 10-bit displays, and you'll also see like 10 plus 2. Um, 10 plus 2 or like anything past 10 will typically only be for content creation. So they'll typically be exorbitantly priced because they know consumers aren't buying it. And if you're buying it, you probably have money. Uh, 8 plus 2 is what I would consider the good standard these days. I shouldn't write these so close because they're not actually tied to VA or IPS. So these days, 8 plus 2 is probably where you're going to be, but laptop screens and whatnot will still ship with 6 plus 2. It's fine. It's not great. If you look at a gradient, you will easily be able to tell these apart if you're using 10-bit versus 8-bit color on the computer. Um, it, the, the difference becomes very noticeable. You get lots of banding. Um, but yeah, so between these, IPS is typically considered the best. Uh, of course, what you're considering the best depends on who you are. If you're, well, if you're a tech person, you look at a screen for long hours, you probably want good colors that you can calibrate. So IPS tends to win. You're doing photo editing, video editing, IPS tends to win. You're doing gaming. I would still say buying IPS monitor. Like, <laughs> the response times have gotten fast enough where you probably don't need that slight boost that you would get from TN or VA. The exception being if you're buying a curved monitor. A lot of curved monitors these days, as I said, are VA. A lot of TVs, as I said, tend to still use VA because they don't want IPS glow. However, IPS can look good on a TV as well. So those are the three main panel types. So if we were to rank them in terms of colors, IPS is the best, gets three stars. VA gets two stars. TN gets one star. It's the worst, awful colors. If we're ranking for response time, it's actually the opposite. TN tends to win. VA is second. IPS is third. And basically, you, I mean, you can see where the trade-off is going. Uh, response time, uh, motion blur follows response time very closely. Color calibration accuracy tends to follow good colors. And same with viewing angles. IPS is best for high, best viewing angles, OK viewing angles, and awful viewing angles. Um, there's one thing I didn't mention here, which is that these days you might have been hearing something called mini-LED. Uh, there's terms flying around like mini-LED and micro-LED. What are mini-LED and micro-LED? Um, they sound similar. They're actually completely fundamentally like different. Micro LED is truly impressive. I've never gotten to see one, but it's supposed to be the next big thing. Uh, micro LEDs are very much like OLEDs. So I'll put micro LED here. Mini LEDs sound similar, but they're actually not exciting at all. Just like how the manufacturers pulled the scam where they started calling the same LCD displays LED just because there's an LED backlight. Mini LED. It's just a backlight type. And let me be very clear to draw a dividing line here. <laughs> um, mini LEDs are, well, basically what we've started doing is, I said that one of the fundamental downsides of IPS displays is that they're not very good at doing black levels. 
So, because there's always backlight that's going to be, that's always on, right? This thing here is always on and you're just trying to block as much of it as possible. Um, so how does mini LED work? Well, basically, mini LED is kind of tied to the concept of local dimming. You can have local dimming without using it. So let's talk about what local dimming is first. Local dimming basically means that historically, all the light, all the LED that you had back here were all tied together. So the whole backlight was either on or off. Of course, you can dim it, but the whole thing would act together. You can't, uh, like you can't turn one light on, but one light off. The concept of local dimming says that, well, why do all of these lights have to be tied together? We should be able to control them separately. So if, for example, if I'm like, if there's a bright part of the screen here and this side's dark, well, to make the dark scene look dark, why don't we just actually turn the backlight off? Historically, this was done through something called dynamic contrast. Dynamic contrast looks at what's on the screen and then like adjust to backlight accordingly. So if like in a movie, if you're in a bright scene, the backlight will be at 100%. If, it's, if you're in a dark scene, it'll dim the backlight. Dynamic contrast tends to look bad because you don't really get dynamic range from it. If half the scene is bright, half the scene is dark, it just freaks out, doesn't know what to do. It doesn't look good. You can see like the backlight turning on and off. Um, what local dimming does is basically take this, divide it into zones. So a typical display can have a couple hundred zones. And this way, basically, you divide it into a big grid. And so each zone acts like its own backlight. It looks at, hey, what, it, what is on my little section of the display? Is it something dark or is it something bright? If it's something bright, crank the backlight there. If it's something dark, turn the backlight there off. And that's essentially how local dimming works. Now, a lot of laptop and computer displays are edge lit. This means that the LEDs aren't actually behind the panel. Rather, the LEDs are embedded at the top and bottom, and they use a diffuser to be, try to get as even uh, light distribution as possible from the top and the bottom uh, throughout the whole plane. Now, of course, that means that then if my LEDs are only on the top and the bottom, as you see typically with display HDR 400 displays, um, your local dimming is based on vertical bands. If it's like bright on the top, dark on the bottom, they can't do anything. They can only do it in like these vertical slices if like the right half is bright versus the left half is bright. So that tends to not work as well. The problem with putting them behind is oh, these LEDs are so large that you can only put like what, 20, 30 of them before like in, in the back of this plane. It also adds thickness. Also means that now I have to like, get rid of the heat back here. So on TVs, you would see it. On TVs, you could get a couple hundred dimming zones. With mini LEDs, it's literally exactly what the name says. We've taken the LEDs that we use in the backlight and we've made them smaller. So instead of being able to fit like 100 LEDs back here, we can now fit 1,000 of LEDs back here. So with mini LEDs, you can go all the way to a couple thousand local dimming zones. And of course, that means that HDR and whatnot is going to look a lot more convincing because now we can like more finely be like, oh, there's a bright thing here, there's a dark thing here. Now, a disadvantage of local dimming is, I mean, if you have like a dark wa wallpaper, if your computer has a black background, and I have the mouse that's like one bright spot, you will typically see a halo around it because well, the LED behind the mouse icon has to be like lit, except the problem is those were so large that you were lighting up like 10% of the display just so you could like see where the mouse is and you ended up with these massive halos. So mini LED helps to reduce that a little bit. You still get lots of haloing, especially if like you have a single bright dot like a mouse cursor on an otherwise dark display. But of course, for things like movies, that means you get a lot more convincing HDR. Now, typically, we can talk about display HDR, but HDR, uh, that's a whole separate video I intend to make at some point in the future. Dolby Vision versus display HDR versus PQ versus, there's so many of these certifications and HDR modes, and they're all weird. Not all of them are the same. There's ones that are good, there's ones that are bad. But essentially, display HDR 400 means you can go up to 400 nits. It's a that's a VESA specification. It's not a way of doing HDR. A way of doing HDR would be something AMD FreeSync Premium Pro versus which uses uh, PQ curves. But yes, uh, so for 400, you'll typically use top and bottom light. But if you want to do any higher, you want to do like display your 600 or display like 1,000, you will need to use mini LEDs. Um, and you can do get like display share 1,000 even on uh, LCDs. For example, the Asus ProArt displays. And yeah, that's one other benefit, by the way, because we have so many more of these LEDs instead of only having a, like a couple, like a handful, you can get much brighter displays all the way to thousands of nits. Uh, and this means that typically you can sustain it on the whole screen. So with OLEDs, we'll talk about it, but you'll only get that high brightness on a small fraction of the display. Whereas with this, you can sustain it over a much larger area because the power draw is known. We don't have to worry about burn-in. Uh, oh yeah, burn-in. I said that there's a lot of burn-in with CRTs because the phosphors tend to wear out. With LCDs, well, you can get some amount of burn-in. Uh, 
it's been greatly reduced over the years. You typically will not see it on most LCDs. Um, you will see what is called image retention. Image retention is essentially like, think of it like non-permanent burn-in. This happens a crazy ton on my uh, home monitor, where if you have a, say, a text document open with like a uh, Word document, like a white center part and like the dark theme outside of it, you close it, you open something gray, you will see the outlines of it. Typically, it happens more on the edges of a display. Um, but the thing with uh, image retention is typically it will go away after 15, 20 minutes, especially if you put something else. Now, if displays already tried to kind of mitigate it, right? Like LCDs don't run on DC. If they run on DC, they would burn in and die instantly. So instead, you see the display will actually flip the positive and negative ends of the LCD, uh, just like how you would do like for fluorescent lights in order to you know, not get the pixel to like wear out as easily. But you will still get some image retention, especially in newer displays that have lower quality control than the original LCDs did. Um, it can be bad, but it's not a, at least it's not as bad as burn-in. So that's what mini LED is. More backlight dimming zones, they go brighter, they have better contrast. Um, fundamentally, it's the same type of display. It's not self-emissive. Do not confuse it for micro LED. They're very fundamentally different. That's LCDs. Finally, I think we can move on to the last type of display, which is OLEDs. Yeah, IPS. Oh, I should mention, like, I, as I said, there's a lot of IPS-like. HWVA, even though it has a VA in the name, is actually an IPS panel, hyper-wide viewing angle. There is a, what's the other one? Samsung used to call it PLS. Instead of in-plane switching, they call it plane-to-line switching. But it's actually the same thing. They just don't want to. Those are the, these are the cool ones. Cause, so finally, since like 2020, these are starting to take over. And in a lot of ways, LCDs were downgrades compared to CRTs. Because CRTs are basically self-emissive, they had very good black levels. LCDs don't. Because it's self-emissive, basically, they had no motion blur. LCDs have a lot of motion blur in comparison. So in a lot of ways, we took the backs for the form factor and whatnot. Uh, OLED and especially micro LED are kind of like the best of both worlds. Now, OLED has fundamental downsides, major, major downsides that we'll talk about. But overall, much better. Basically, we take this image here, and it's one panel. There's no backlight because the LED themselves are the backlight. So you'll essentially have lots and lots of LEDs. And instead of using the LEDs to light a panel, which then shines through and like, by panel I mean like a pane of glass or whatever, which shines through an LCD, we get rid of all of that. The LEDs just face forwards. And if you want red, you turn the red LEDs on. If you want blue, you turn the blue LEDs on. If you want green, you turn the green LEDs on, so on and so forth. Of these, there are a couple types of OLED panels. For example, uh, these days Samsung is producing what are called quantum dot QD OLED panels. And uh, that just means that, well, there's ways of getting red, green, and blue, right? Uh, so traditionally, you would use white LEDs because, well, red, green, blues weren't like, OK, so when I talk about why do you need OLEDs instead of normal LEDs, normal LEDs are too big. You can't put, nor you can make displays out of normal LEDs. If you've been to like a concert hall or a massive venue, instead of using projectors, they might use like LED video walls. You kind of need that scale for LED displays to work. We can't really make them too much smaller because as small as they are, they're not small enough for this to uh, properly work. Um, so that's why OLED and uh, micro LED especially are interesting because then we can actually start making these in reasonable uh, form factors. So uh, traditionally, then you would use white LEDs, except the white LEDs, then you would have to color the top of them as red, green, blue to be able to get RGB. Um, not great, but it works. You might have heard of Samsung called uh, AMOLED displays. AMOLED displays are fundamentally uh, OLED. The AM just stands for active matrix. So on a phone, if you have an AMOLED display, that's just an active matrix OLED display. It's kind of more marketing. It doesn't make it particularly special. Um, uh, QD OLEDs are interesting because instead of using white LEDs, they actually use blue or UV LEDs um, or near purple LEDs. And then they will use quantum dots in order to, uh, which can basically take and change the wavelength of the light from blue to green and red. And that's cool because they're just like lasers. You can get very, very, very precise wavelengths out of these, which means that your colors can be like a much deeper red, a much deeper green, a much deeper blue. To get a deep red, a deep green, to deep blue, you want to narrow down uh, the wavelength of light to one specific frequency. So this is why, for example, laser projectors can get uh, pretty wide color gamuts because you're producing precisely and only pure red, pure green, pure blue, just because how lasers work. And quantum dots can do something very, very similar, where you get very pure amounts of red, green, blue. The other, uh, so that's QD OLED. 
QD OLED today is probably the best type of OLED you can buy. Although there's only a couple displays on TVs using it for displays, the only one's a 34 inch panel. Uh, the other type that's used by LG typically is called W OLED. W OLED stands for white OLED. Essentially, OLEDs have this problem where on a big scale, they're not very bright because they'll burn in. So what W OLED does is it adds a white subpixel. So instead of being RGB, these are actually RGBW. And Windows sometimes freaks out with OLEDs and you get text fringing. And we'll talk about why that happens. It has to do with subpixel rendering and relates to this diagram. But basically, the way an OLED monitor works is exactly as I said, instead of having all of these filters, the pixels themselves light up and emit the light that you see. That's the fundamental principle. Um, they work much, much better because this means that when I have a black scene on the screen, the pixels just turn off, which means that you get pitch black because there's, well, no light that's being emitted from the display. So you get much lower black levels. You get much short, uh, faster response times because LEDs are pretty much instantaneous to respond. They can instantly turn on and turn off. In fact, they're so fast that you can get away with using schemes like pulse width modulation in order to actually change the levels of them, which wouldn't basically be possible with an LCD. The response time of the LCD will take over and balance it out. With the LEDs, they can actually turn on and off fast enough. And this means that you also get pretty much no motion blur. So they have a lot of advantages. Um, The downside is, however, OLEDs are susceptible to burn-in. And that's because these are organic molecules. The more you actually, uh, the brighter you run them, you will eventually end up burning out the pixel itself. Uh, and this means that, you know, this is very common. You'll see it on phone screens or on like, TVs that have been showing the same thing for a long time. Now, OLEDs have started to get better. So burn-in is becoming less and less of an issue every day. Uh, but however, it's still the major downside, as well as price. They're really expensive. <laughs> Should include that as well. Oh yeah, and with these, of can of course say this is a an IPSS. So if that's a dollar, two dollars, this is like five dollar signs. So very pricey, um, but you're, we're slowly starting to see OLEDs in, uh, shipping with uh, modern TVs as well as some computer monitors. Finally, LG has announced that CES their 27 and 45 inch uh, OLEDs, which can do 240 hertz. Because of course, I mean they're so fast that. Why wouldn't you run them at 120 or 240 hertz? Running them at 60 almost feels like a waste. As, I mean, as if the electronics are fast enough to keep up. Um, but they all have burn-in issues. And we'll have to see how this plays out. There's lots of things you can do, like pixel cleaning. But all pixel cleaning does is like, burn everything else out to match the burnt-out sections. So like, it's more so masking the problem than fixing it. And there's lots of uh, things that they'll do. For example, they'll do pixel shift, which means uh, they're actually very similar to plasma displays in terms of how plasmas work. Plasma never made it big in the computer space, but it was kind of big in the TV space for a while. So we can talk, uh, I'll do a comparison to plasmas shortly. Um, but you'll get pixel shifting, which means that the image will move left, right, up, down by a couple pixels, just so that if you have hard edges, like a border between a black and a white section, uh, you won't end up getting the same thing for, you know, you won't end up burning out just the white pixels that will gradually shift it so that you get a smoother transition. Also, screensavers, maybe we'll make a comeback. And the other thing you'll notice is with HDR, obviously, these are going to be a lot better because, well, your contrast is infinite because black is black. The thing is, OLEDs are typically power capped, which means that on a, mass, on a big TV, if I only have like a tiny rectangle, that tiny rectangle can be very bright. Even on computer models, it can be 1,000, 2,000 nits. But the bigger that rectangle gets, the darker I have to run the display. Because otherwise, you'll hit a power cap. You'll produce way too much heat. You will burn all the pixels. So they're typically um, power limited, which means that the bigger of an area you have lit, the dimmer the display gets. That's typically fine for stuff like HDR, because only a small fraction of the scene really needs to be very bright. But it is something to consider. Now, I said Windows likes to freak out when you have OLEDs. And the reason is, for something like a QD OLED display, the display is actually using triangular circles. Um. Since I mentioned subpixel rendering and pixel arrangements, I wanted to give a couple of demonstrations. These are just sample pictures I've taken just with my macro camera on my phone. And to start with, here's a close up of a regular LCD panel. This is one for my TV because it's easier to see the pixels, but it's the same for computer monitors. You can see that all the pixels are square, and within each pixel, we can see the red, green, and blue subpixels. This is typically called a normal RGB pixel layout. If this was sideways, it would be vertical RGB or vertical BGR. Some panels use BGR, but realistically, those are all pretty standard and Windows can deal with them. So 
what you're seeing here is the color white being shown. And that's because all of the red, green, and blue subpixels are all lit. Now let's look at some OLEDs for comparison. For comparison, here's the subpixel layout of a QD OLED. This picture is from the Alienware 32-inch QD OLED monitor, the one that uses the Samsung QD OLED panel. Um, in this case, you can see that the pixels are in a triangular arrangement. So we can see that, for example, at the very top row, you can see the lit row of green dots with the red and blue dots underneath it. Unfortunately, th since this is a relatively small monitor, it's not perfectly in focus, but I think the point's pretty clear. You can see that um, since Windows is expecting there to be three rectangles in the order of red, green, blue, and in this case, we're getting triangles with green on top and red and blue on the bottom, um, text that's supposed to be using that anti-aliasing method is going to have look well, is going to have color fringing. But here you can actually see a close-up of some text on this monitor. So this is for a given uh, folder, a given directory on the desktop. So at the top you see the icon for a directory on Windows and you can see that the gradual fade out isn't great. And at the bottom you can see the text uh, released and description for the directory. And you can see that there's like blue bleeding into the left-hand side and, and red bleeding onto the right-hand side just as a result of how Windows is trying to anti-alias this and failing. What makes QD OLED how deep the colors they display can get. So you're seeing the Alienware 34 inch QD OLED monitor in comparison to my laptop which is a ThinkPad T14 Gen 2. The exact panel that it has is linked on my website. But you can see when it's supposed to be showing red the laptop looks orange by comparison. Nowhere near the same saturated red that the QD OLED can show. Finally, this is a picture of a W OLED monitor. This one comes from the Corsair Xenion Flex, which is a 45 inch panel. And you can see that it not only has red, green, blue, but also a white subpixel that is lit. And in this case, I just have some text in the middle and you can see how there is the red, green, and blue artifacting around it. Just because once again, Windows doesn't know how to deal with RGBW subpixels. Let's see some more examples. Here's a really simple one. This is just the AMD logo that you can see on RGBW. And finally, here's some more text that you can see. Once again, you will notice that the bo especially the uh, borders around the letters have particular issues. Now, if you can switch to using grayscale subpixel rendering, most of these concerns are alleviated. But I wanted to just point these out in person so you can decide for yourself whether these are deal breakers with an OLED panel or not. There have been various types of it. In the past, displays would use uh, red and green squares, and like the blue would be like a bigger rectangle. And so, especially on some of the older OLED laptops, you can uh, see this effect where, well, Windows doesn't really know what to do with it. Because how Windows text rendering works is that's a completely separate uh, topic, but for subpixel rendering. Essentially, in order to anti-alias text, so if text was basically just running the pixels black and white, it tends to look very, very jagged. So in order to make this better, Windows does anti-aliasing. If, if you've done any gaming, you know what anti-aliasing is. Um, won't get too deep into it, but essentially you'll uh, smoothen that line out to do uh, gray on the sides. Um, and so that's AA. Uh, but Windows then does uh, subpixel rendering on that. So basically run the display at triple the horizontal resolution because we can then further break down the pixel into RGB. So if I have a line that I'm trying to render like this through the section, well, I can make this one very bright, this one darker, this one darker, and on average, it will help me get that rendering, as opposed to just doing you know, grayscale subpixel rendering. So it's good because it makes text look smoother, but the problem is it's always expecting this RGB pattern. And if you have a display mounted vertically, you might have had to do redo calibration because that's going to completely throw it off track because now my pixels are sideways. There are some monitors that use BGR, where the panel is essentially upside down. Those are also fundamentally different because uh, so on Windows, this is, by the way, called clear type. You'll have to do clear type calibration. The thing is, clear type works with RGB in any of the four directions. It has no idea what to do with these pixels, where the RG are on one row and they're square, and the B is on the next row and it's a rectangular. It doesn't know how to deal with that and how to anti-alias if a line is being drawn across it. So you tend to get these color fringing on text. And the fringing's happening because Windows thinks that it's what it's actually doing is it's helping smoothen that out over the RGB. But what it's actually doing is what it thinks is RGB isn't actually RGB. They're not side by side. So you end up with, if, the, if you had a line going here, it's like, well, I'll add a little bit of blue to help smoothen it. But the blue isn't actually at the right of a pixel. <laughs> You're lighting up the row below it. So you tend to get that uh, fringing. On Linux, this isn't the problem. If you use grayscale uh, anti-aliasing, you won't get this issue at all.
And with QD OLEDs, of course, it's different again because now we switch from this arrangement over to this arrangement using the triangular uh, triangles full of the three circles. So various things in use. I think LG does for their W OLEDs. It's like a square with four pixels. The point is, it's different. And well, eventually, computers will learn how to deal with it. But at the moment, that's one downside of it. Now, I said that the main downside of OLEDs is that they're susceptible to burn in. That's because these are organic LEDs. Uh, and as I said, that's because normal LEDs aren't small enough and efficient enough to use on OLED panels. Well, that's what micro LED fixes. So micro LED is very impressive because it goes back to using the traditional inorganic LEDs that we know and love. This means that they can run a lot brighter and they don't burn in as often because it's just typical inorganic chemicals that you'd see on normal LEDs. So micro LED is pretty hyped at the moment. It's designed to, um, basically it's all the advantages of OLED without the downsides other than the cost instead of $5 times, maybe at 10. And the fact that we can't really manufacture them at large sc uh, scales at the moment. So you, there are a couple micro LED video walls on the market uh, that you can do by tiling these up. However, they're few and far in between and they're not at a scale where you can go and buy. So they're not, not really not on the markets yet. By the time I edit and upload this video, maybe they will be. And finally, I want to draw a quick conclusion between OLED and plasma. Now, plasma was popular back in the day uh, before LCDs really took over. So think mid-2000s to 2010s. You were still seeing plasma displays, especially with even at 720p, maybe even 1080p, maybe even 3D displays. That's because plasma has a lot of the advantages of OLED. Just like OLED, it's self-emissive. Just like OLED, it has very good black levels. It has very fast response times. In fact, it came around the age when pre-TN, like very blurry LCDs were the only types of LCDs you could get. So if you want to do anything like watch sports or whatever, and you didn't want motion blur across your whole screen, plasmas were your go-to. Um, they're really heavy because they were pure glass, but it's not really a concern. The main thing, though, is uh, just like OLEDs, they were susceptible to burning. And eventually they failed because LCDs fell in price, uh, as, I think as far as I can say about it. Uh, very, very similar to uh, OLEDs, though, though because um, they're self-emissive. It's just instead of LEDs lighting the display, we have plasma. Kind of exotic when you think about it. Really is a fun thing that was really popular for a while, uh, but then I guess died down. Uh, I think 2010s is when all of the big manufacturers, your Panasonics and whatnot, started shutting down their lines. But you had, all, you had most of the advantages. I mean, I can't say much about color gamut because back then TVs used the BT601 color space, which isn't very white to begin with. And most things were SD anyway. HD was like just starting to happen. But yes, very fast response times, no motion blur, but had burn-in issues. So it kind of is uh, falls alongside the same family of OLED and micro LED that it was self-emissive. But that's a thing of the past. Maybe it was too far in the future for its time. Um, and then LCD happened, and now we're switching back to it. And I think that about wraps this up. <laughs> With that said, I hope this has been a good overall introduction um, and that I've been able to explain the fundamentals of CRTs versus LCDs versus OLEDs and self-emissive displays, as well as the different types of LCDs you see, like LED backlit, mini LED backlit, as well as the types of panels, TN, VA, IPS. Uh, I hope this was a good overall introduction and helped explain the key concepts and the fundamentals. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave it in the comments down below or uh, send me an email. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for watching.